of these systems, and I like that he added um, information about the um, autonomic nervous system because that is part of our stress response where we're going to have that fight or flight, if you guys remember that. And he did show that nerve going directly to the medulla of the adrenal gland, synapsing, and that's where we're getting the release of what we know as adrenaline, that epinephrine and norepinephrine. So yes, stress is any situation that will upset homeostasis. He used the one about the fire alarm. But notice, he also tried to point out that even though that is like a spot, like a, like a spur of the moment type situation, he tried to also point out that everyday life stresses can get to us just as much as having something that's a more traumatic experience. And any situation that will upset homeostasis, that is considered stress. That means, do we have any situation that is affecting blood flow, affecting the beating of the heart, affecting the temperature of the body, affecting the breathing, affecting digestion, anything that will be considered um, a disruption to the homeostasis of the body. So, we, and I really liked that he added the sympathetic system, okay? They're mediated by the endocrine and the sympathetic nervous system. Now, the cause of the stress could be physical or emotional. He kind of mentioned how we, how stress could be how we perceive a situation, you know? Because sometimes, I mean, I guess a good example of that would be us, uh, you know, like, being a student, we will be like, oh no, I've got a paper due. Or, oh no, a test is coming up. You know, something to that effect. That is something that we're not having anything really physical happening, but we've got something emotional occurring. And that can be stressful also. So our body has what's known as a stress response. And the first few little videos that I was looking at, um, I was trying to see if I could find something stress response related or general adaptation syndrome because the body's reaction to stress, whether perceived or real, okay, goes through these processes regardless. So if we have a stressor, whether it's a true stressor or not, just the fact that the, the response got started, okay, the body's going to respond in these three ways. The first way, of course, is our alarm reaction. He gave the example of the fire alarm, but it's whatever disrupted the homeostasis. Okay, whether that was something actual, like the fire alarm going off, or something perceived. Oh no, I've got a paper due. Okay, so we're going to see that the fibers from the nervous, uh, from the ANS, they uh, they synapse on the medulla of the adrenal gland, which of course begins that process of preparing for fight or flight. Now, um, do you guys remember the um, information about how uh, the glucose sparing, for example, okay, and then uh, to get the muscles and everything ready for the body, it'll help, you know, use like fats, for example, as fuel so that the glucose can go be used by the nervous system, okay? So we get that alarm reaction. Then we get... It, after this reaction occurs, and because we're using products that are available to the body for energy, and we prepare the body, increase the heart rate, increase blood pressure, increase breathing, decrease digestion, okay? 
because all that's taking place, it requires a lot of energy. Okay? If this occurs a lot and occurs for maybe a long period of time, you can actually get into a stage of resistance. But now the stage of resistance is where, okay, this is going to be, um, we, we've used up energy sources that are available. Uh, the body needs to calm down and replenish them, or we're going to have to start breaking down other products, depending on the time given for the stage. And I'm going to explain that in just a second, okay? <clears throat> stage of exhaustion. <clears throat> when sources that are available for energy are gone and it's very difficult to replenish them i.e. you might be eating but wait a minute blood flow has slowed down to the digestive system absorption absorption of nutrients is less use of the nutrients is less okay this usually leads to when health can decline. He did note how in cases where these stages occur too often or are sustained, it can begin to affect other parts of the body, i.e. like the immune system. If it gets too far, the body is going to be depending on breaking down proteins unto the point where death will most likely ensue. Now, the best example that I can give you, okay, is the one I experienced personally, okay? I've mentioned that I lost my son very tragically, okay? He was my only child, okay? And for about a year, after that, okay, I was in the situation where I stayed in alarm. I mean, I, I unless you're a parent, it's difficult, okay, but you are so traumatized, okay, that you're literally wondering, how am I making it through the day? And so, I definitely got to that stage of resistance. I got to the stage of exhaustion, okay? Uh -huh. I got to the point where even though friends and family, you know, were forcing me to make sure that I ate, okay, because I didn't want to, all right, um, but they made me, and then, you know, it's like, okay, we've got to, we've got to do something here. You know, this is not healthy. I literally got to that point where my health was starting to decline. Okay, and my doctor was like, you know, this can't continue, uh, family's going, this can't continue, and then, you know, that's when you hopefully decide to try to address the stress, okay, whether that's counseling, yoga, meditation, whatever the case might be, because your body has been in a constant state <clears throat> of the release of the chemicals, to the point where you're not really functioning anymore, okay? Your brain's not working right, muscles are not working right, digestion's not working right, and you have to break that cycle, all right? Um, if it continues, and in some cases it does, okay, it can continue to the point where death ensues. It's a reason that stress is so detrimental to health. People who have stressful jobs, for example, and, you know, if they can't make changes or do something like that, they end up having high blood pressure problems. They end up having stuff like digestive problems. Um, it can go on to be problems with, like, muscle problems. I mean, it, can, it just progressively gets worse if the cycle doesn't break because every single time the body's going through that response, Releasing um, from the adrenal medulla, using of the energy stores, going into the state of exhaustion, going back to trying to get the, the, you know, going back to getting the release, going back to exhaustion, release, 
exhaustion, at least to a point where it's just <gasps> and there's nothing left to be used except for the proteins of your body. That's when muscle starts to break down and things are not good in the body. So the stress response, okay, um, is not healthy, but you know, it does happen pretty much all day, every day, if you think about it. I mean, driving down the road, walking down the street, whatever the case might be, there are little things that stress us out, but hopefully we get a chance to recover from them. That becomes important. The last part, something that we will be coming back to as we get into future chapters, um, icosanoids, which are a special type of uh, chemical, some other signaling molecules, these will be coming back to us in like the immune system uh, as we move into the respiratory system, as we move into the cardiovascular, okay? These are chemicals. They do not have to necessarily travel in the blood. Do you guys remember where I said the local, because we had the term, what is a paracrine, okay? And it was basically local where a cell could talk to a cell, okay? And then we're going to talk about the autocrines, and um, we'll come to that when we get into the blood and the cardiovascular system. But this is just another way that chemicals can communicate with cells and affect what they produce. Icosanoids, <clears throat> now we're going to get into this because it becomes important in inflammation. Just don't forget it, okay, because it's going to be coming back to us. And then we'll talk about some other icosanoids that are important in the function of like blood clotting and so forth, like at times of trauma. So these are other types of chemicals, but they do not necessarily have to be moving in the bloodstream. They can be acting more locally. Like, for example, when you have trauma or a cut or something like that, those ones with like blood clotting become important, but they're right there local. They're readily available. Now, the endocrine disorders, there are quite a few. They can be due to either overproduction or underproduction of a hormone. Pituitary disorders are common. They're more common than you would think. Um, where it gets a little extreme is, you know, some people can end up with gigantism or dwarfism, but there are lots of other pituitary problems that are out there that don't go to that extreme. Thyroid disorders are probably one of the most common that you're going to see once you get out there uh, doing clinicals and getting into your areas of study. Now, adrenal disorders, they're not quite as common, but they can have some pretty serious effects. Usually takes a while for them to actually get diagnosed because they will be mimicking so many other different types of disorders. The biggest one you're going to see, diabetes mellitus. Now remember, the term diabetes itself is strictly about the urine, okay? Mellitus is letting you know that it's the one type 1 or type 2, okay? These are the ones that you are going to see. They're very common. Makes up, even though it looks like a small percentage, that's a huge number of people, and that's just the U.S., okay? I think, now don't quote me on it, have to look it back up. I think worldwide, the U.S. has the most cases of diabetes, mainly because our diets are so unhealthy, okay? Um, it is a disruption to uh, carb, fat, and protein metabolism because of the use of the insulin not working correctly. Classic signs. Poly, too many, urea, too much urine, polydipsia, the um, water intake, so there's a lot of water drinking, polyphagia, eating, okay, so it has some classic symptoms that are present. 
Um, because